Hello. Today I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the process of application to US universities and colleges. I also wrote about it on my blog, and I'll put a link to it down in the description. And my talk would mostly be focused on graduate applications, but of course, it's also applicable to undergraduate applications. And now I came to United States as an undergraduate student in 1996. And at that time, you know, there was no internet in Pakistan. So you actually had to ask, write to a college and ask for application materials and then meet all the requirements. But thankfully, because of the internet now, pretty much all colleges and universities have a very clearly streamlined admissions process and you can do most of the work by using their online tools. So if you are applying as an undergraduate or graduate, of course, you'll have to first do your research about what you want to study, where do you want to apply, and for that, internet is the best tool. You can also try to see if the local embassy, the US embassy or consulate in your area offers some kind of guidelines or workshops. There could also be some uh, as, you know, department in your own at your own local college or university that could give you some guidelines. But after you've uh, figured out where you want to apply, what are your top colleges, what are your backup colleges, uh, then the best way to do is to go to the particular website of a college and click on admissions link and follow it all the way to international students. So for most American universities, the international students mostly deal with the Office of International Studies. And most university websites would ask you to create an account which for which you would require a functional email and they will gather your information and then list the documents and materials that they need. And then you just follow the progress of your application through that. Now, generally, what is required is both for, for undergraduates, of course, if you're not from an English-speaking country like Australia or Canada, if you're applying from any other country like Pakistan and India, the first uh, requirement is uh, TOEFL, okay? either a TOEFL score or a test of in international English language test. Both are acceptable but check on the website and see which one is accepted. And you will have to take TOEFL and send uh, your uh, score to the institution before they can take a decision. In most states, it's actually a requirement, so no one can waive it for you. Uh, some colleges for undergraduates would also ask uh, the SAT or ACT. Sometimes they can waive it, but it's good to ask if they absolutely require it. For graduate admissions, uh, for humanities, social sciences, you will require a GRE score. Now, for undergraduates, so what you do is you report your TOEFL score, you fill in the form. They will have, uh, some colleges will have uh, certain questions that they will send you and they'll ask you to answer 700 words, 500 words. Now make sure to be really precise in answering those questions. People do read them. Don't go over the word limit, but also make sure that you know your grammar and style is impeccable. Now, one thing to avoid is don't add many sob stories in it. Just try to be honest. If the question is about what is the biggest challenge you have faced in your life and how you handled it, um, keep in mind if you're 18 years old, maybe you're biggest challenge cannot be a huge thing that it could be anything in your life. Most of the times what the colleges are looking for is not just how big the challenge was, but that, you know, you can articulate that there was something challenging that you encountered at school, at home, and then you figured out a way uh, of handling it personally, but also sought help. Some Colleges would also ask you to explain what would you add to their institution. And since you are an international student, 
you could very easily write a 700 word essay explaining you know what you bring to the institution what kind of cultural experience so an answer always has to be a combination of who you are what you can add to their institution and what are your hopes and aspirations from that education for graduate students the requirements are different for example at unt we have a two-pronged system there are certain things that are required by our graduate school and certain things that are required by our departments so what the graduate school would want you to submit is of course your gre score but even before that the toefl score is a must so take your toefl exam first your toefl score then your gre score then the international office and the office of graduate studies would ask you to provide uh, your credentials you know personal information also a writing sample three letters of recommendation and fill in any other forms that they might need and the three letters of recommendation and your writing sample and of course your scores from your previous studies so the scores the gre score like your grades, GPA, average, and everything, and your transcripts, your GRE score, and your TOEFL score are the college requirements. The departmental requirements are your writing sample and your three letters of recommendation, along with those other materials that college would forward to the department. Now, having sat on many admissions committees, I think the most important thing for PhD studies, at least in English, would be your writing sample. So please make sure that you send something that is your best work. Ask your friends to help you edit it, but that is what you're representing yourself. Then the department will also ask you to write a brief 700 words statement of objectives. That's a kind of a technical document because you are trying to show in it that you know the department that you roughly have an idea of what you would like to study. Sometimes people do mention a couple of professors they would like to study. I am iffy about it. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't because you never know who is on the committee and what do they think of your candidacy. But if you really want to study with a couple of professors there, then when you mention their name, you should also put in there what you have read and what you know about it. These are some of the things that are required. Now, the process is most applications are accepted for the fall admissions. So, for example, if you want to come to UNT, you will apply now. The decisions would be made somewhere in April, and you will start in the fall of 2020. Therefore, like most application deadlines are in December of the preceding year and then you're applying for the next fall very rarely would an institution accept someone for the spring semester one of the reason is pragmatic because our funding comes in in the fall and that's when we know how many phd students can we fund so if you are applying for fall that means that you should start gathering your materials the summer before not just the summer immediately before that fall but the summer that precedes the spring before that fall. I hope that makes sense. Um, so another important thing of your application materials is the three letters of reference. Now, I have noticed that sometimes people have asked someone to write a letter of recommendations and it's just one paragraph. Uh, the competition for graduate admissions is really, really, you know, very swear. So please only ask people who have the time to write you a good letter, who know your work, and who can speak about your work and your work ethics. Someone you trust. So make sure that contact you contact the people who are going to write your letters well in advance so that they have sufficient time. Give them all the information they need, your CV, what have you done lately, so that they can write you good, detailed letters. And these are required by the department. So that means when we sit on search committees, 
we go through your credentials and through your test scores, your GPA. But the two things that we spend the most time on is your writing sample, because we're trying to gauge what kind of potential you have as a graduate student and your three letters of reference, because we also want to know what your former professors have said about you. Coming to the writing sample, most universities would ask you, and this is for graduate students, for a 20-page writing sample. If uh, it's a literature department, obviously they will be asking for something, something that relates to literary studies. Now, the leading system of citation in literary studies, at least in the United States, is the MLA citation system. So make sure that you don't not that it will matter that much, but if you send one with APA, you know, people might ask why are, why isn't this person using MLA? That's just like something technical. Also, you, it should be your paper should be written like a graduate research paper. It should have a topic that is somewhat original, right? It should have a strong thesis or a controlling idea and then a coherent argument. Make sure that stylistic, stylistically it's perfect, that there are no typing errors. And by and large, you know, your best paper. And, and don't just, you know, pick up anything that you think meets the page requirements. You have to put some effort in it. So after you provided all the materials to Graduate Student Studies Office or Office of International Studies. So the, in the first phase, what the Office of International Studies for graduate students or the graduate school does is they check all your documents that they need and they compile that file. And only after you have given them all that they require, your GRE score, right, your TOEFL score, your transcripts, is when they will move your file to the department. Now, you will be sending the same people your three letters of recommendations as well as your writing sample. But most of the times, that can take a little longer. So they will move your file to the department after their requirements are fulfilled. The department, then the committees meet mostly in January of each year. And by about March, is when the departments have decided who are they going to admit in their programs. And beginning of April, end of March is when we send out acceptance letters. Now, the acceptance letter would stipulate and explain what is being offered to you. Do you get a teaching fellowship or teaching assistantship? What kind of tuition waiver? Um, and based on that, you can sometimes write to a department and say, you know, I'm an international student. Is there any way uh, for the first two semesters you reduce my teaching load because you'll be required to teach two courses if you're a teaching fellow or something like that? But most of the times the offers are sent out. Now, remember, throughout this process, no one has asked you yet whether or not you can pay. OK, because we don't factor in the ability to pay in our decision making. I think legally we cannot do that. Now, after you've accepted the offer and written back to the department that, yes, you would love to study at, let's say, at UNT, the department will then inform Office of Graduate Studies that this graduate student has accepted, right? Um, then the Office of International Studies will be in touch with you, right? And they will then ask you to prove to them that you have the ability to pay. So you can you know, refer to them or send them a copy of your acceptance letter in which it says this is what the university would give you in terms of a scholarship. And then if there is any difference, they will ask you to prove whether you can cover the expenses not covered by the scholarship. And that's when you will furnish your bank statements or something else that can prove that you can bridge the gap. And after you've done that, that is when the Office of International Studies will issue you what is called an F1 visa form. right? And it will be mailed to you in original. And when you get that, 
you have to then put together your visa application using the forms from your local U.S. consulate and everything else, get an appointment, make sure to take your original F1 visa form with you. And most of the times it's just a formality, but sometimes, you know, the, the most important question that the visa counselor will ask you is for you to prove that you have the intention to return, right? That's a question that they, what they are trying to figure out is whether you will overstay your visa or whether you know you will finish your education and come back. So be cognizant of that when you take the interview. But after you've done the interview and gotten your visa, that's it. You can then start your graduate or undergraduate degree at a US college. So just to sum up, start early, start in the summer, gather your materials, take your TOEFL exam. If you're required to take GRE, take your GRE, gather your transcripts from the universities that you've attended, ask people to write you letters of recommendation, send them your CV and your information, and fine tune your writing sample and your statement of objectives if you're applying to graduate school. And after you have all those things ready, then if you've already done the research about where you want to apply, start the process. Now, also keep in mind that a lot of people are, are reluctant to apply to Ivy League universities, but the thing is the Ivy Leagues have a lot of funds. They're also inter interested in internationalizing their student body. So I highly recommend that you apply there as well. Don't be daunted by the expenses but also keep a few backup colleges, the public universities or liberal arts colleges, so that if you don't get accepted in highly ranked universities, you have some that are equally well ranked, may not be the top universities. So these are like some of very general ideas. I'll post some links in the description below. And if you have any other questions that I have not answered, um, you know, please uh, feel free to uh, put it in the comments, send me an email or send put a comment on postcolonial.net and I'll be very happy to explain anything further. Thank you so much for joining me.